For tonight's panel, I'll share some anecdotes about what I call peculiar personal artifacts of early Mormonism. As truth in advertising, I must admit that during my first years as a Mormon historian, I had no interest in artifacts. Written records were what I emphasized, but I eventually learned that by examining artifacts, we could have gained a very important understanding of what written records barely mention. Appropriately, my first experience with them concerned the best-known artifact of the first man. In 1921, the LDS Church's publishing house re released Apostle Orson F. Whitney's book called, titled Saturday Night Thoughts, which stated, quote, the ruins of Adam's altar are still to be seen in that part of the old new world now known as the state of Missouri, where they were identified by Joseph the Seer in 1838, unquote. This referred to the prophet's designation of a certain valley in Davis County, Missouri, as Adam on Diamond. In Wilfred C. Wood's 1958 book, Joseph Smith Begins His Work, Volume 1, there was a photograph of this altar, or, or what was left of it, showing a tree surrounded by broken pieces of rock. Flash forward 11 years to my first visit in that region. The day after Christmas, 1969, I began driving from Salt Lake City toward my military assignment in Washington, D.C. To relieve the boredom of that drive in, in the dead of winter, I decided to visit church history sites along the way. In the Liberty Jail's LDS Visitor Center in Missouri, I got into conversation with an Idaho farmer who was a, a missionary guide there with his wife. I told him that my next stop was going to be Adam on Diamond. Oh, you don't want to go there now, this old guide said. They haven't rebuilt Adam's altar yet. <laughs> to the uncomprehending what that he obviously expected from me, the guide continued. You see, every, nearly every Utah Mormon who visits the place takes a souvenir rock from Adam's altar which is nearly gone by October. So in the spring, workers drive a pickup truck of rocks to Adam on Diamond and dump them next to the sign. He added with a smile, Idaho Mormons ain't that gullible. <laughs> Flash forward eight years later from, uh, from that uh, experience to the living room of church patriarch Eldred G. Smith in Salt Lake City. His son Gary had invited me there to do an interview with his father about the history of the patriarchs who had been sustained as prophets, seers, and revelators in the LDS church since the 1930s, pardon me, 1830s. Eldred G. Smith had custody of diaries, correspondence, and artifacts of their ancestral line back to Joseph Smith's brother, Hiram, and father, Joseph Smith Sr. I was eager to see these. That night, the patriarch showed me what he described as a Kabbalistic document that had been passed down from Joseph Smith Sr. to Hiram and from his widow to each eldest son in turn. Eldred asked me what I thought of it. Staring at this gold-colored parchment inscribed with numerous symbols and words in various languages, I said, well, it's certainly unusual. I didn't have a clue what it meant, and no idea why Joseph Smith Sr. had possessed something so strange in the early, 20, or early 19th century. Now, I wasn't totally ignorant of Kabbalah as a medieval Jewish system of occult knowledge. Still, I had absolutely no interest in such an arcane topic and quickly asked Patriarch Smith to show me the diary book, or account book, of his ancestor, Hiram. Now that was evidence I could understand immediately and interpret. I was so tunnel visioned that I didn't even think of the talk LDS Institute Director Reed C. Durham had given to the Mormon History Association a few years earlier. I hadn't attended, 
but I had read a typescript of his emphasis on Joseph Smith's connection to the occult through an artifact, a Jupiter talisman, as he called it and as he described it and explained its meaning to the audience, a stunned audience, I believe, some of whose members are here even today. There were dots to connect, but I didn't see them while looking at this parchment in 1977. It would have been recognized by some non-Mormon scholars as a layman, quote unquote, that's the title, used in ritual magic. By mid-1985, I was no longer indifferent to such artifacts. Folk magic had become a subject of immense interest among Mormon historians, and I eagerly read Durham's talk as well as the groundbreaking work by Art de Hoyos, Jr. This young Masonic scholar had already published photos of the gold-colored parchment, plus two other laymans passed down patriarchally from Joseph Smith, Sr., ultimately to Eldred Smith, who had shown them to me. This opened up to me a new world one that I did my best to understand and describe in the book Early Mormonism and the Magic World View. It had photos of the Smith family's three unusual parchments, and my research showed that their inscriptions and purposes had been described in occult handbooks readily available in the mid-1820s. As part of my research for that book, it was my privilege to hold in my hands other artifacts that are more generally known and revered as sacred by Mormons. This included two of Joseph Smith's seer stones. First, a small sandy-colored round one that I examined in Wilfred C. Woods Museum north of Salt Lake City and south of here. And second, a large greenish rocky one uh, seer stone that I held in my hands after it was transferred from the temporary custody of Princeton University's library to descendants of its Utah Pioneers owner en route to a private collector, where I, I think it still remains, and whose identity, by the way, I don't know. Uh, but luckily, I, I had photographs of it from the Princeton library, and I actually held it in my hands. It was quite a, an unusual artifact. In the archives of the Community of Christ in Independence, Missouri, I also saw a dark-colored spherical seer stone that once belonged to Book of Mormon witness David Whitmer. I also examined and photographed three artifacts used by he for healing by early Mormons. These were shown to me by descendants of those who originally had them. First was Apostle Wilford Woodruff's beautifully designed handkerchief that Joseph Smith had blessed for the healing of sick by touching it to their foreheads. Second was John L. Butler's cape that the Mormon prophet blessed for his bodyguard to use for healing. Each of those I saw through the courtesy of a descendant of each man. In Salt Lake City's Daughters of Utah Pioneers Museum, I also examined and photographed the old black cane that Apostle Willard Richards used for healing the sick by touching them with it. Also at the DUP Museum, I held and photographed two of Brigham Young's prized artifacts. First, a dove and olive branch medallion that he received from Joseph Smith, and second, a bloodstone, quote unquote, uh, encased in a gold frame, which Brigham used as an amulet for protection, according to statements by members of his family and as recorded in the DUP records of acquisition. In the LDS Museum of History, I stumbled across yet another unusual artifact of Joseph Smith, a serpent-headed walking cane. In its carvings, I saw echoes of the occult that were obvious in the Smith family's parchments and in Joseph Smith's Jupiter talisman. By contrast, other observers see only carved allusions to Jesus. And that is, in many ways, a, a principal part of this question of artifacts. We can examine them and their context, but very often they have multiple contexts and multiple possibilities of meaning. And in many ways, just as beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, with artifacts, meaning can be in the eyes of the beholder. 
Although its symbols are unknown to me, another beautiful artifact is among the illustrations in my Magic World book. It was a gold neck ne necklace and pendant that Joseph Smith gave to his plural wife, Eliza R. Snow, whom he married in 1842. The gold locket he gave to another plural wife, Flora Woodworth, in 1843, did not survive Emma's foot. The practice, Emma being the legal wife, the practices and faith objects represented by many of the above artifacts were well beyond my own experiences of religion. Nonetheless, from 1977 to 1987, I felt honored to examine those objects that were revered as sacred relics by their modern custodians and those who had preserved them. In significant ways, they are physical reminders to us of what, in a very different context, British historian Peter Laslett called the world we have lost. Thank you.